Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to take a few seconds to say thank you to that you came to that presentation today. Um, and I hope you went out of this room inspired and with great motivation and enriched knowledge as well. So, um, what is this presentation about? Just make it look cool. We have all heard that. We've been um, We've been working with clients that would just say, come and say, oh, just um, you're the artist, just make it look cool, you know. Um, you know how to do that. So in this presentation today, I will um, show you the approach of Ink and how Ink is making things look cool and how we create me memorable projects in an already memorable projects world. So, um, a few years ago, I didn't know what CGI was, to be honest. I am... Um, uh, admitting this embarrassing fact that I thought images like this one are created just by pressing the mouse of a button, <laughs> of the button of the mouse. But a um, few years later, I got um, into uh, CGI. I was actually coming from a very artistic background. I was into art, music, and um, animation, but just drawing a couple of frames. I, I had no idea what computer animation was about. But when I watched a really cool documentary about Pixar, I told myself, OK, I know what CGI is, and I really love computer animation now. So I want to dig, dim, uh, dig um, deep into that. So I got accepted in Boromach University. I graduated with quite success. But um, in my first ever assignment, I created this amazing render. And I thought to myself, OK, I'm killing it. I will have a spot in Pixar someday. Um, apparently, with um, three years later, I, with kind of um, really hard work and passion, I managed to graduate successfully and create um, a short animation about the Bulgarian um, village and the Bulgarian tradition. It was on the news. It was really well accepted in uh, Bulgaria. Um, <laughs> In 2016, when I graduated, I came back uh, to Bulgaria to attend one of uh, Cow's group presentation back then. And I remember um, attending exactly uh, Cow's group presentation about the Bulgarian village, and I was so inspired, and I told to myself, oh my god, I want to be like these guys someday. I want to um, just inspire people, be on stage, and create cool things, and show them to people. So um, I really wanted to meet the people from Cows Group back then, and I was like, oh, I'm too shy, I don't want to go. Um, and I was just about to go out, go home to the, from the event. When I went back and I said to myself, OK, I need to meet these guys because they're so inspiring. So I went there, I met them. And um, they introduced me to someone who happened to have a studio in London. And that's Kamen, who, who is the co-founder of Inc. And three years later, I am here as a speaker, part of this amazing team of Inc. And I'm so proud to be presenting today the amazing work we do. <laughs> Thank you. So, who are Ink? I bet um, some of you know. We are a really cool production studio um, based in London. Uh, we are really passionate about technology and beauty. Like, we really like combining beauty and technology, and this is like the whole um, idea behind the studio. We believe that beautiful, when beautiful meets technology, this is where the magic happens. Um, so, um, I was really inspired what the atmosphere and uh, uh, the whole environment in the studio was. And not only that, but the, the greatest thing I, I thought about this studio is, uh, was that they somehow managed to create such an amazing work. And um, the environment was like almost I'm among friends and family. Um, Yes. So we, as I said, we are passionate about technology and we are trying to find beautiful ways to express every idea we have. doesn't matter if it's a car or if it's like a really boring, boring technical thing that we have to visualize. This is what we think. <laughs> Um, and this is a team. Uh, we are a really passionate artists that um, are really, really into the work they do. And here is to mention that we uh, collaborate with one of our, uh, like we collaborate with a partner studio in Bulgaria called Artray. So you can see all of us together in this photo. Um, yes, we just love our work. We enjoy our time together, and we we are very passionate about what we are doing. Um, we are a um, 
artists from concept to uh, 3D to post-production, so we basically create all the work in-house. We have um, in-house built render farm, we have in-house tools to um, help the production. And today, I am going to focus on some of the projects we completed recently. As I said, we are a quite diverse studio with a um, wide range of projects that we've completed over the past couple of months. So I thought it's, it's cool to um, focus on something as a VR with educational purposes, um, some of our commercial work, some of our um, inside work, and um, uh, the latest Honda that was um, revealed in the Geneva Motor Show. So I'm going to start with that. Um, we have established a really good relationship with Honda in the past few years. And um, a couple of months ago, they just came to us and said, OK, so we have this electric car, the, the new fully electric car of Honda. Please make it look cool, because we have this uh, Geneva Motor Show that we have to uh, present it. And we were like, OK, we, we can do that. Um, so we made that. Um, that's the, um, the film showed in, the, in Geneva, the motor show. That was, uh, the concept was shown for the first time. It was actually a car that's going to be built really soon. Um, just to introduce you to what the project was about. Um, until this point, this car was um, like a concept living in a virtual context. So we had to make um, a way to visualize this car being like coming out from the concept to the real life environment. And this is what we, yeah, what we achieved at the end. We kind of um, tried to have this abstract world in the beginning when the car is driving into like a almost roller coaster um, Hot Wheels thing, and then go into the real world, saying, "Hey, I'm here. I'm already um, on the on the market." So um, we had a couple of challenges creating this project because in the beginning the the team um, the client was a bit like oh we want a really dark film we don't we don't feel about we don't feel good about the idea of having this energetic vibes but when they saw the first uh, style frames that you can see here uh, they were like okay we're loving it we want we want that so we tried to keep um, everything in style really clean and really. Um, simple in terms of design, because the focus had to be just on the car. Um, yes. Uh, sorry. <laughs> and how do you uh, approach such a simple and um, a graphic design? I will give you a couple of tips and tricks of how we did that and how we created the film, because one of the biggest challenges was that we were so limited in time. We had like just I don't know, maybe a month or even less to create that and just make that whole film happen for the motor show. We are 3DS-based um, studio. We use 3DS Max as a main um, main software, but because we found this, um, we found Cinema 4D to be one of the the greatest and really fast way to create the layout. So we use this procedural um, procedural. Um, rig to create the road. So while we were doing the layout, we could have just tweaked it really easily to adjust the angles of the camera and just to find what shapes we like and like visualize the car and how we like it, how we like to see it on the screen. 
basically, we just, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Cinema 4D, but it was a, a very good way to procedurally cre create such, a, such a, a thing, instead of just going in Max and then tweak, tweak things there. Uh, we placed a couple of nodes in the scene, and the node gives the position of the, just a position in space, and then we use a tray, uh, tracer to create a spline from that no. So basically, when you tweak the no, you can always tweak the spline so you have a different shape. And after that, after creating the geometry and duplicate, duplicating it in a uh, straight line, we can wrap this, um, uh, this geometry around the spline. And then after that, with the help of the nose, we can, uh, we can tweak the whole road and the layout. So that was really helpful for us because we can just go and see the beautiful angle of the car and say, OK, that's the camera we want. We want the road to be on a specific angle here. We just tweak the nose and we are done. We, we had the layout really, uh, really, really fast. Um, Another tip I have for you was we didn't want to spend any time building such a, a basic city, but by basic, I said, yeah, it's um, rectangles, but you still have some details. So if you had to build it like from scratch, we have to go on every uh, building and say, oh, we need this detail here, this de detail here. But instead, uh, we use the city kit, which is a plugin for Cinema 4D. So with the roads and the city, we, can, we could get the clear idea of what the whole piece would gonna um, look like. Yes, um, another tip is that we used motion camera and cinema. This little dude is holding the camera. It's great because it gives you such a realistic uh, idea of what the, um, the, the movement of the camera could be. You know how, how um, uh, cameras, when they're static, they, look just, they just look CGI. And we wanted to achieve for the um, movement of the camera in general, the whole piece of work, we wanted to achieve something more realistic and something more uh, in engaging. So um, I found that motion camera was, um, was one of the greatest things I've actually discovered in Cinema 4D um, because you can easily, easily tweak, uh, tweak things around. It's basically like um, you having your ha camera on your shoulder and just move around and like show cool things and cool angles. You can um, follow the subject or you can just rotate it around just like an actual camera. It was great and I, th I think that one of the greatest advice is to use your camera smart and just make the right decision for that. It was really paying off at the end. And of course, because we were doing the, um, the live action, which is the second bit of the part, when the car is integrated, the CG card is integrated in the CG, uh, in the real, um, the live action uh, footage. We wanted to uh, have, of course, a consistent lighting. So we went on, on set there and we said, okay, uh, we have to do the HDRI, uh, HDRI by, by ourselves. So we have to have the kit and create the uh, background and like, have the whole lighting consistent. That actually was very, um, very helpful because it worked straight away at the end. We just plugged it in and it was all good. So that's for Honda. The next one I'm going to show you is a um, campaign we, we did on the last month or two for Nespresso. Nespresso had this uh, really interesting idea having a, a really cool abstract environment with lots of coffees flying around to showcase the, their newest project, uh, product, which is the Brisa, the foam maker. So um, we wanted to create something cool, as they wanted to create something cool. And this is what we did at the end. We have another film, but it's a similar version. It's not released yet, so I can't show you, but it's really cool. It's blue and fancy. Um, OK, so to begin with, what the brief was, of course, it was like, we want this boundless world of coffees flying around in an abstract environment, um, something like Escher's work, and you know, like just come up with something that's nice and interesting and engaging. This is what we have at what we had as a concept. And because we were doing the whole um, launching campaign for the, the, this project, 
Uh, we had to do the still images for social media. We had to do the two films. We had to do like quite a lot of work on that. And on the shooting for the still images, we were told that we only have three cameras and we only can have three angles. So basically, we were quite limited in what surfaces could be and how many of them we can shoot at the exact day. So we came up with um, some uh, layouts. We we said to the client, OK, do you, do you like those? There were some changes. And then they came back and said, yes, we can go to the shoot. So we created this um, little layout that helped us on the day to actually calculate the angle and um, shoot the coffees on the exactly uh, right angle, because otherwise the perspective will go even wronger than it is. So these are um, the final images. Uh, we had a couple of, uh, of them. Um, where we, we can see the actual footage of the coffees with um, the barista uh, integrated in a CG environment with um, um, the chocolates and capsules and all these um, funny stuff. Um, the tricky bit here was like uh, we had to use the coffees, but everything was CGI and the coffees weren't shot in the same lighting as the, they are put in the environment. So we had to go back and relight stuff um, just shadows and reflections, so we can build that into post-production and create these um, accurate images. In terms of animation, it was a little bit tricky because we had these really uneven surfaces, so we had to go to the camera and like with the camera and just tweak around, see what works and how to make everything engaging, as well as we had to, um, we had to um, bear in mind that we are creating not just one main film, but film for every social media like Instagram, different crops, you know, like different social media uh, videos. So one of the first tips I have here is, of course, make your modeling as accurate as possible. We had that, we had that device, a caliper, I think it's, it's called, that measures um, things with the great, great uh, detail. So we had to go and we, and Nespresso had like a specific cups and glasses in mind. They wanted to create um, really unique pieces. Even the capsules, we had to go and like actually measure everything in the scene and create it as, as accurate as possible because after that, when you put them into the environment, they had to behave um, realistically. Um, and how do you create the perfect foam? Um, these are the shots from the, uh, from the, the set. Uh, we had a specific barista who actually was a foam maker, um, a lady that came all the way from US to create the perfect coffees. This is what she do for a living. She's creating great, beautiful coffees. And she was really helpful at the, at the shoot because not only we were limited with angles, but we also were limited with um, having cameras, so we had to do three angles, but we only had two cameras. So the third camera had to be one of the two we had before. So um, to have the coffee in a perfect condition, she had to recreate the coffee, so just to take the, the last shot. It was very um, intense, I would say. Um, instead of approaching everything with like um, complicated simulations and different, um, just different complicated approaches, we decided because we were again pressure, um, pressured in time, as it's um, a commercial, it's always like that with the, this project. Um, instead of doing something too complicated, we decided to the best and more, most efficient way is to make textures. So everything as a material you see here is created by um, textures, so all the foam, and all the, um, the coffees, they are all built in materials. They are not simulated. There, is, there isn't anything, um, um, uh, yeah, anything simulated in there. So basically, we were um, using different ramp and gradient maps to uh, make the division of the, of the coffees and the foam. Um, you can see like bump maps to create a little foam and the bubbles at the beginning. We had to simulate a little bit of, um, um, of the ice in the glasses, so we achieved like a um, a natural way in the summer selection that you can see. The lighting was quite um, interesting because um, we had to um, lit every single surfaces in a, in a different way. So um, what we did here as a, a little bit of a tip 
<laughs> is if you have a scene like that, when the client comes and say, OK, we want the shadow to be absolutely consistent. We want to be um, not really big, but soft, but not really soft. And we want not to interact with the other surfaces. Then we had to make a way to actually um, achieve that. So we divided all the surfaces by themselves and exclude and include different geometry and the different coffees corresponding to that um, surface they're on. Uh, so in that way, we could achieve the, um, the soft, tiny shadows, but still in a really cool and like uh, stylistic um, way. So um, a problem we faced when we were doing all the rendering was like, if you've seen the beginning of this film, uh, it will loop again. We have these really weird reflections all the way to the, in the coffees and in the beginning of the, of the barista machine on, on the lid. And it was taking super long ages to render, plus we had this um, flickering around. But we actually found a way to um, solve that in a really, really, really fast way to solve that. It was very efficient, very, um, very um, quick, and also we gained quite a lot of time for rendering because when we tweaked the um, dim distance of the reflection of the, all the reflective sur um, surfaces to be like just um, uh, lower, the the flickering disappeared. And basically, if you say, oh, I want my surface to reflect from until this point, then it doesn't, all, all the other reflections don't, doesn't appear. So you have like a clean render with like accurate re reflections, but nothing as a, nothing unwanted. Ooh. Yeah, another project um, I'd like to talk about is E.ON. And we were approached to create um, a very interesting and engaging, as they said, um, uh, video loop, loop um, that the cats are uh, building up a server and actually giving it um, a life. So, we, who doesn't like cats, who doesn't like animals in general, so for Ink, that was quite of a very, um, like a dream job. We created that little loop to, um, yeah, to make, uh, to, to, to show how cats can uh, lit up a server and build it up. And it's kind of a, the, the brief was like, oh, make it cool, make the cats glitching, make it like a, um, just a nice video people would love. Um, it's on their website. Um, and yeah, it was a, a great challenge because there is nothing in common between cats and servers. So in, we had to find a way to um, integrate the cats in the server in a funny and quite interesting way, but in the same time to be like um, something like a nice piece, not just funny cats around. Um, so we had a shooting with cats which was a bit um, interesting. They are quite um, not well behaved. Uh, they don't listen at all. Uh, they'll be like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so um, we had these cats, for example. We tried to um, grab the attention for ages, but it couldn't just, it couldn't just um, yeah, care. <laughs> um, so a couple of uh, challenges we had and how we overcame that was we on the set, the client really insisted on having um, um, the uh, uh, motion camera. So basically, the camera was moving and the cats were moving. So the the uh, the whole motion was kind of had this ramp effect. So the actual constant moving of the camera that we could use for the whole build up um, CG environment to integrate it in was like. Um, a few seconds, but the client was really into it, like, oh, we like this cat, we want to use exactly this footage. So we had to find a way to compensate for um, the cats that wasn't m moving right. When we built it into the environment, um, the cat would just go um, and slide or just would be fa fast or too slow. So we had to animate the planes of the projection to just compensate for that uh, movement of the cat that's not accurate. So it wasn't just like, oh, we have the cats, let's build them in into, into the environment. Uh, we decided that it's a really great idea to just render the scene as it is without any cats, any reflections, and build everything in Nuke. But that turned out to be uh, quite a nightmare. Just because, first of all, we agreed to have like five cats, and at the end they had 20. Um, 
but we uh, somehow managed. One of the things that we faced uh, challenge was um, the reflections, because with that motion camera we couldn't really get the right reflections as the, the projected cut in, the, in Nuke weren't touching the ground, so we had to actually make that up a little bit and build the reflections um, inside manually. So we had to go and grab, um, I think I have a, no, and grab, uh, grab the cut, reverse it, and build the reflections um, just to be accurate. We couldn't, everything was rendered already from Mark, so just to save time, we, we thought, oh my god, it's going to be great if we just build everything in Nuke, we get the reflections, and, you know, it's, it's done. Well, it wasn't like that, so my advice here is just to think about um, twice if you want to build something and um, in Nuke and have this all, everything reflected around. And um, yeah, one of the greatest advice is keep your comms really tidy because that helped us a lot. To be honest, these two comms were separate, so we had to first render every cat separate for the reflections and then build that in the beauty comp because the beauty comp, comp could um, actually integrate the cat, the cat in terms of grading and how it looks visually. Yeah, um, building the servers wasn't really um, a hard job, but um, the client wanted every single server to have a different amount of lights and how they they blink. So they wanted like a random um, a randomness in the all the lights. That was very important. Um, and after building all the all the servers and making them instances, we had to go over and uh, detach all the little lights and make them on groups and animate them with. Um, uh, with, um, mo uh, with noise as a way for something to make like this randomness in the, in the lights. So that was a fun project to work on, but it was a little bit of a hustle to create all of that reflections from here, from there, and work with the cats. It was a great project at the end, though. And you've seen that on the keynote today. This is one of our, um, of our self-directed projects. It's called Bloated Motors, and it's all about British cars. We, um, at the beginning, everything started with, um, we're really passionate about cars and architecture. So at the beginning, we had a scene with like um, our architectural things, and one of the buildings just inflated. But that was too busy. It wasn't ink style at all. And we really like creating simple stuff, as I said before. Um, so we said, OK, our next passion, our, our other passion is cars. So we want to do something funny with cars and still got that um, interesting inf inflating um, uh, motion happening. And we did that. Yeah, we started as um, building some scenes with having just cars floating around in different environments, but we also thought it's really busy, so um, keeping things really, um, really simple and really just um, tight and, and clean is what we like and what we think is visually pleasing um, for people as well. Uh, so we um, started as building all the three uh, British, car British old cars and um, 3ds Max. We kept the geometry super simple with just only one object. So if you want to create simulation like this, just keep in mind that your geometry needs to be one. Even if you model everything separate, make sure that at the end it's all actually merged in terms of actually with the vertices merged. So we had to do that and keep the geometry really, really, really low poly. But all the details were done after that and with textures and displacement maps. So here you can see the material. It was a bit with just cold material and blended into a V-Ray material. We also had um, displacement maps for the, um, for the uh, lights and all the um, handles and stuff, so we can have that realistic result. Um, what was uh, nice to mention here is that because it was a balloon um, feeling of the car that we wanted to achieve, we actually went in uh, that brush and uh, we sculpted every single crease just to make sure that when it floats, it looks like a balloon. So we had to sculpt every single um, every single crease and then animate that in, in, in 3ds Max just to achieve that uh, balloony look. 
Uh, lights, we experimented with lights a little bit. So I advise you, if you have like animations like this, just uh, move the lights within the car, because otherwise everything looks too static and not accurate. We used, um, we used um, uh, different approaches for the lights. Um, just to make it um, as accurate as possible, like uh, gradients um, on, on the light. So we have like one of the surfaces a little bit lit more than the other one. In terms of animation, as you can see here, this car is more static than the other one. And this is because we wanted to achieve um, a character in the cars. It's not just about, oh yeah, we simulated these cars and they flow around. No, um, we wanted to achieve characters. We wanted to make sure that these cars are actually giving something from themselves. Uh, so um, to create that, we um, inflated everything in max. But after that, we had to go and tweak every single simulation to just attach things together to make it more stiff or to achieve that um, really floaty, almost like um, um, swimming car around in the space. So that's the final one. We have three of them, if you haven't seen them. <laughs> and the last project I will introduce to you is called INEG. So we were um, approached from the uh, Emirates, Emirates Nuclear Energy Corporation to create six films for educational purposes. Um, Yes, we created these films, but the approach was quite interesting. And instead of doing just six films, we did six VR films. And that will begin with... The Baraka nuclear energy plant is on the Arabian Gulf coast of the UAE, nearly 300 kilometers from Abu Dhabi city. These are a couple of the scenes that we've built um, to create uh, these films. So the interesting, here, uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, we approached that in VR just because we wanted to give the... For, the whole idea was to inspire the next generation of scientists. So we wanted to give the next generation of scientists, mean, means the students and kids, we wanted to give them as close um, um, experience as possible to what is it to be into like such a massive nuclear power plant. Um, so you can, see, you can see you go into the power plant and you see the atoms collide and create that nuclear fusion. Um, but to build all of that, we were given none of the design. So we had to go and do our research, which is my first advice, do your research, because sometimes you can just um, be given nothing and said, oh, just make it look cool. Um, we have nothing for you, but we have the idea. So we went to, we, we went and we digged into the design and what it is to, uh, to build a nuclear power plant. Everything was built in Max, comped in Nuke, and um, we had a specific 360 um, sound of it. So how did we render that? Um, by the way, we had all the renders were 4K, which is quite massive for such a um, for such piece, and we had all these six films to render, so that was quite tedious. But um, how we approached the rendering? So we used the, I guess most of you know, but I'll just mention it: the V-ray stereoscopic object, which is basically a helper that you put on the scene, and from the selected camera, it gives you the uh, this two cameras for both of your eyes, which you can then tweak with the um, within, within the setting, settings to create the offset for both uh, of your eyes. Oh, also, we used, um, uh, the v uh, we used obviously, V-Ray to create though, this 360 um, video, like um, render, and uh, we render through the, just replacing the uh, field of view with 360 and then created that um, 360 image. <laughs> and yeah, at once we have um, 
700 machines rendering, and um, it was a little bit wow. <laughs> With 700 machines, 4K render, um, we yeah, it was quite a lot of data producing. So um, to have these efficient renders, because they were long, they were really um, uh, they were really heavy. Um, we had to make it as efficient as possible, and we created the light cache before. So for all the, the little tiny moving objects, we had to ignore um, the GI, so they don't produce any artifacts in there. So all these objects that are moving, so for example, we, we, we go into that um, uh, massive uh, room with the reactor in there, we had to exclude just the doors from the GI. And um, after that, we just have that clean render with, without any artifacts in there and have that um, simple approach to it. Uh, yeah, some people would say, oh, no GI, it looks a little bit uh, off, this object, but it's, it's after you put it in comp, you can compensate that, exactly that that object didn't have any GI, plus it's like a massive, um, massive scene, so you couldn't really spot that. One of the um, advices I have about how to create this uh, X-ray effect really quickly, because the director was like, oh, we want this to look like old-fashioned scanning thing, uh, please just to just find a way to make it. Um, we, we found that, um, we found a really easy way to create actually that. It was just rendering the whole um, environment with um, V-Ray extra texture, and then these two lines crossing the, um, the room, they were created with um, just two boxes animated like to cross the room with applied V-Ray distance texture to it. So basically, it recognizes just the, um, the vertices and gives you that result. And after we put it in comp, we got that um, straight away. Very extra texture and a very distant texture. Finally, the electricity is distributed in the switchyard, carrying 1,400 megawatts from each unit to the whole of the UAE. Finally. Ooh, yeah, you saw that. Um, so just to wrap it up here, um, these are the, the projects we worked on recently, and we have learned quite a lot of, uh, of things from producing them on how to create abstract worlds to how to build a power plant and how to make balloon cars, which was quite cool, and how to interact with cats, which is a, um, a, a yeah a challenge. Um, yeah. To sum up, efficiency is key. As I said, we are always trying to find the, uh, the way to, ha to, to create everything in more, a most efficient way as possible. Um, try new softwares. As I said, we don't really use Cinema 4D, but we, we thought it's the best way to make that um, uh, work for between Cinema 4D and 3ds Max at once, and it gave us a really quick uh, result. Spend time to do your search. As I said, for Inek, we had to create the whole power plant by ourselves, do the co-creative vision of it. So we had to spend our time creating all of the work. And stay curious and passionate about your work. And how do we stay cu uh, curious and passionate? Is we always look for stuff. We always attend um, conferences, presentations. We always keep um, ourselves myself, um, I'm part of Seagraph London, and that keeps me really motivated and really inspired. So um, yeah, just just look look around you. It's it's always there, the knowledge and the um, the great work. Just like make it look cool. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I forgot to <laughs> thank you. I forgot to mention that we have the VR here with us for the last project you saw. So um, if someone wants to try it and just experience the nuclear power, um, you're free to come and um, take a look. It would be great to show you. And also, we are always um, looking for passionate artists. So if there are any students around, like young people that want to join this um, great world of ink, um, come and see us. Uh, we are three of us at Ink today, so we'll be around, and yes, we will, um, we'll be happy to chat with you. Thank you.
Thank you, Joanna. Um, we do have a couple of minutes if anybody has a couple of quick questions. Anybody in the audience? Hey, and thanks Hello. for the presentation. It was really cool. Uh, I hope. Just a question about the cats. Uh, yes. With so many animated uh, models online, how, why did you, uh, or why did the customer, or wh who, who made the decision, or, and why? Um, to use real cats. Uh, to be honest, that was, was a uh, the client really wanted to use real cats. Plus, you can't really achieve that uh, super um, realistic feel of the cats moving and playing around. So we always prefer to have that as live action. Uh, but it wasn't our choice this time. It was the studio we work with. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. One more. We had their hand up. There we go. Hi, Joanna. Thanks for that great presentation. Um, you just use so many really cool softwares kind of in all your projects. And I wondered, do you ever start a project not knowing what software you're going to use or, or that you haven't used it before? Or do you always use self-initiated projects to learn it first? I don't hear you at all. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try and hold it a bit closer. I just closer. waited for you to finish. And <laughs> do, you, do you start your projects not knowing what software you're going to use, or do you always learn the software first in self-initiated projects? Um, so if it's a client work, we basically chat about that a lot before when it's like the concept and creative um, um, part of the project, because we always divide the project like, oh, we have time for creative, and to, just to brainstorm. So if we think like a specific project needs a specific software, we always have the resource to do it. Like, we have um, 3D artists that are always passionate about learning new stuff, so we use that. For a self-driven um, self project, I mean, it really depends on the idea we have. So basically, if the idea uh, is um, if the idea needs something different, we'll try to get it from a different software. This is the way we're trying to um, keep ourselves really into the industry because we don't want to be like, oh, we just use Max and that's all. We want to be diverse. We want to have like um, a very great and wide knowledge of um, softwares and um, approaches to projects. Yeah. Thanks for the question. <laughs> great. Thank you. Um, so while we switch over for the next speaker. If anybody wants to take a look at the VR, we do have a few minutes after this if you want to pop up. And then yeah. that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone.